I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. The LNP won the by-election for the Gold Coast seat of Fadden last night, forced by the departure of former Minister Stuart Robert. There was little change in the two-party preferred vote from the general election last year. But a win is a win. And it's been a long time since Liberals at a state or federal level have had much to celebrate. Peter Dutton put the result down to the hip pocket pain voters are feeling. The government is well aware how sensitive this issue is. On Friday, the Prime Minister announced Philip Lowe won't be given an extension of his term at the helm of the Reserve Bank. It comes after the Governor suggested interest rates were unlikely to rise until 2024 and then lifted them 12 times over the past 14 months. The Treasurer has chosen Deputy Governor Michelle Bullock to take the top job, a decision that's been widely applauded. Later, we'll bring you full analysis with the panel, Samantha Maiden, Shane Wright and Katina Curtis. First, to the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers. Thanks very much, David. So let's start with your thoughts on this by-election result. No repeat of what we saw in Aston a few months ago for Labor. What do you put this result down to? Oh, well, first of all, uh, David, congratulations to, to Cameron Corwell, the new member for Fadden. I acknowledge uh, him and the work of his team and also thank Letitia Del Fabro, who was this wonderful local community champion who ran for us. And we're very grateful that she flew the flag for us there in Fadden in what has been historically very difficult territory for us. Now, we are neither surprised nor troubled by the outcome in Fadden. It was entirely what was expected. Uh, if anything, uh, the LNP underperformed against the historical average, and that's after spending more than half a million dollars on the seat, which we think was probably at least 10 times what Labor spent on the seat. So unsurprising, uh, untroubling, uh, congratulate the new member. Uh, this was entirely what we expected. But was there any message, do you think, for the government on cost of living? Oh, look, we already understood uh, before this uh, by-election in Fadden that people are under the pump. That's why the primary focus of my two budgets, the government's economic plan, the primary focus of the government is in providing some cost of living help so we can take some of the edge off these pressures without adding to inflation. That was true before Saturday. It's true after Saturday. It remains our focus. And similarly with the seat itself. I mean, this was a, a safe blue ribbon LNP seat with a double digit margin before Saturday. It will be all of those things after Saturday. We are aware of the pressures on people before the by-election and that's why it's our primary focus. I mean, you could say Queensland generally is pretty safe uh, LNP territory, a bit of a blue wall. Does Labor need to make better inroads in your home state? Oh, of course we do. You know, it's been hard yards for us mm. in Queensland for some time and uh, obviously, you know, we need to do much better in Queensland than we have for the last decade or so. Uh, there are opportunities for Labor here in Queensland. I think Queenslanders do uh, respond well uh, to the type of leadership that Anthony provides. You know, this was hardly Labor heartland, this seat uh, on the northern Gold Coast, uh, which has been very, very difficult for us for a really long time. But I think more broadly, there are opportunities for Labor in Queensland. We do need to d perform much better here at the federal level. Uh, and obviously, as a resident Queenslander, uh, I'm very focused on that too. Let's turn to the Reserve Bank. Uh, did your decision not to extend Philip Lowe's term as Governor have anything to do with his handling of interest rates? Oh, the decision we took to make this historic appointment of Michelle Bullock to be the ninth Governor of the Reserve Bank was much more about how we take the bank forward into the future rather than any one decision or another that's been taken in the past. Uh, I cherish the Reserve Bank's independence. I'm looking to uh, invest in that independence rather than undermine or diminish it. So this was never about uh, really one person or really uh, any of the decisions taken in the recent past or any of the commentary in the recent past. It's because Michelle Bullock, I think, has the best combination of attributes to take the bank forward. She's an outstanding economist a respected leader, and I'm really proud of the appointment that we made on Friday. But we know after the last interest rate rise, you said yourself, Treasurer, that Australians would find it difficult to understand, difficult to cop. Are you saying it's wrong to interpret your decision to replace the Governor as uh, any sort of reflection on his performance? Oh, look, my decision, uh, which was announced on Friday, or my, re my recommendation to the Cabinet and the Cabinet's decision, was all about you know, how do we make the Reserve Bank the best version of itself. That's the motivation for the Reserve Bank review. That's the motivation for the appointment that we made. I've gone out of my way to say 
uh, yeah. that I have a mountain of respect for Phil Lowe, and I mean it. You know, I've worked closely with him. I've known him for a long time. He has car carried himself with characteristic uh, dignity and professionalism throughout, including, by the way, saying that Michelle Bullock's appointment was a first-rate appointment, and I appreciate that as well. This is more about the future than it is about yeah. the recent past. Uh, and Michelle Bullock, I think, as the uh, outgoing governor has said, is a first-rate appointment. You respect Philip Lowe. Uh, we hear that. Did you respect his last interest-rate decision, though? Well, the point that I made then, uh, and I'm you know, happy to stand by it, is that people who are under pressure uh, you know, w want to understand uh, why these decisions are being taken. Uh, and I know that my responsibility is to explain and sometimes defend the decisions that I take in the context of the government's economic plan and, and the budgets that I hand down not the as Reserve Treasurer. Bank. No, similarly, the Reserve Bank uh, has an important role to play to explain the decisions that they take. And that's the point I made at the time. Uh, and I don't think that's an especially controversial mm. point. Would you understand uh, if Michelle Bullock as governor were to lift rates? Well, clearly the, the existing Reserve Bank governor and the new Reserve Bank governor, when she takes up the position uh, around the middle of September, they will take their decisions independently. They'll weigh up all of the evidence in the economy. They'll explain that decision and sometimes they'll have to defend that decision. And that won't change when the governor of the Reserve Bank changes. Let's talk a bit more about uh, Michelle Bullock. Look, she hasn't given a lot of public speeches. Um, for those who are trying to get a better understanding of what approach she's likely to take, you've talked about her leadership qualities, her experience. Mm. What about when it comes to this core role of, of tackling inflation? What can we expect? Well, you can expect someone who is fiercely independent, uh, who carries a lot of respect and regard. I mean, you rightly acknowledged in your introduction, David, uh, that her appointment's been welcomed across the board. Economists, business, the head of the union movement, uh, the opposition in the end, uh, the outgoing Reserve Bank Governor all consider this to be a good appointment and that's because Michelle is an outstanding economist. She is a respected leader uh, and I think that she will run the Reserve Bank in a really inclusive way uh, and she'll run it with uh, gravitas and with heft and drawing on that mm. really quite substantial experience and expertise that she has accumulated over a long time. But you've spoken to her obviously more than we've seen publicly as part of this decision. Did you talk to her about her approach on inflation? Well, I talked to really uh, all of the senior members of the bank at different times. Uh, certainly, Governor Lowe, I've had a number of conversations about inflation and with uh, the Deputy Governor, Michelle Bullock, as well. I mean, that's, again, uh, part of my role as, uh, of, mm. as Treasurer is to confer with senior members of the Reserve Bank. That's been happening already and it will continue to happen after this leadership change. So what can we expect? I mean, home buyers, the big question is, is anything going to change from the old governor to the new governor? You, you know better than the rest of us. What can yeah, we I expect? Well, I'll tell you what won't change is I won't all of a sudden, because we're getting a new governor, change the approach that I've established, which is to not preempt decisions that they might take, mm. uh, not to second guess those decisions either. I'll continue with that approach. Uh, governor Bullock, when she takes up that role and replaces Governor Lowe, uh, she will be a person of immense experience and expertise, an outstanding economist and leader. Uh, and. Uh, she will lead a Reserve Bank that weighs up the economic conditions as they face them at each meeting. But can we expect a similar approach, a consistent approach on tackling inflation? Well, again, I'm not going to sort of preempt the decisions that uh, Michelle Bullock might mm. uh, recommend to the board. Uh, I think that's really important. You know, this is a, a long-standing and cherished feature of the Reserve Bank is that it is independent. Michelle Bullock is fiercely independent. Uh, and she will uh, undertake this uh, task with professionalism and diligence, drawing on all of that experience and expertise that she has. In a speech she did give a few weeks ago, Michelle Bullock said the uh, economy would be closer to a sustainable balance point if uh, the unemployment rate were at 4.5%. Do you agree? Well, there's obviously a debate amongst the economists what full employment is, whether it's around 45 or a little bit lower than that. Uh, that's been a more, more or less a perennial feature of the economic conversation for as long as I can remember. Uh, the point that Michelle Bullock was making in that speech, which again I think is relatively uncontroversial, uh, is that as the Reserve Bank forecasts and the Treasury forecasts have inflation moderating over the coming months, they do have a tick up in unemployment as well. And I've been upfront about that. You know, the challenges in our economy are substantial, global and domestic. 
Uh, well, I think the slowdown in our economy is expected in those forecasts to be significant and that will have implications for the unemployment rate, which is the point that Michelle Bullock mm. was making. So do you agree the economy would be at a more sustainable point with an unemployment rate of 4.5%? I use different words to describe it, David. I mean, our expectations in the Treasury forecast is that unemployment uh, will tick up. It's at 3.6, which is pretty remarkable. We've got an incredibly resilient labour market. It's one of the big strengths that we have going into this period of global economic mm. uncertainty. Uh, there will be a debate amongst the economists about what full employment looks like in their definition. We're expecting it to tick up a bit as the economy slows as a consequence of higher interest rates and global economic uncertainty. Do you think it's possible to get inflation back down to the target zone without driving in unemployment higher? Well, it remains to be seen. I mean, clearly the, the Reserve Bank's twin objectives are price stability and full employment. Mm. And that's deliberate. That's something that I'm very keen to maintain after we implement the recommendations of this review. And the, a government had, the government has a similar approach. You know, we're taking the edge off these cost of living pressures without adding to inflation at the same time as we invest in the right kind of uh, workforce into the future. And that's because whether you're Reserve Bank or the Albanese government. We want to see as many people in jobs as we can, but we've got to get on top of this inflation challenge, which is the primary challenge in our economy. The primary challenge, no doubt about it. For the government's part, we've, we've you know, heard you talk about what you've done in the budget. Is there any more you think the government can or should do to put downward pressure on inflation, or do you think you've done enough? Oh, well, obviously, at every budget, you make sure that you're aligning your, your plan and your policies with the economic conditions as you confront them. But what we have rolled out so far, David, has been textbook fiscal policy in the circumstances. Uh, moderating inflation, but higher than we'd like. Global uncertainty. And we've done a range of things uh, which are very important. We've got the budget in much better nick, not at the expense of providing cost of living help, but in addition to doing that, our cost of living help is targeted in areas like out-of-pocket health costs, electricity, uh, rent and some of the other particular pressure points. Uh, and we found $40 billion of savings over two budgets compared to zero dollars in savings in the last Liberal budget. So all of those things are about getting the budget in much better nick at the same time as we provide help for people to get them through a difficult period. And as Governor Lowe has acknowledged, our budget is actually taking uh, the edge off inflation rather than adding to it, and that's important. If mm. down the track we need to do something differently or we need to do something extra, of course we contemplate that down the track. But right now we are rolling out uh, what people would consider to be a textbook fiscal policy in the circumstances we confront. So just on that, if, 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 uh, if inflation remains stubbornly high, isn't getting down fast enough, you are prepared to do more rather than just leave it to the Reserve Bank? Oh, we've always acknowledged, David, that we've got a role to play here. And that's why we've got uh, a, the first surplus in 15 years. Our predecessors were unable to do that. But we've done that because we've banked so much of the upward revisions to revenue. Uh, we found $40 billion in savings. We're still providing cost of living relief. All of those things are really important. If our economic plan and our, and our, our next budget in May uh, needs to take into consideration a different set of economic conditions, obviously we'll do that too. Now, you're travelling later today to India uh, for a G20 finance minister's meeting. Philip Lowe's uh, heading there as well. What are you hoping to achieve there, Treasurer? Well, a couple of things, David. I mean, this is an important opportunity in Gandhinagar in India uh, to confer with my uh, ministerial counterparts and also for Governor Lowe to confer with his central bank governor uh, counterparts as well. Uh, understanding what's happening in the global economy is absolutely central to making sure that our economic policies and plans are aligned with these sorts of conditions that we're talking about. And what's happening right now is the pressures that are coming at us from around the world are being felt around kitchen tables and so we need to understand that. So a big part of it is understanding how we can best align our policies here with what's happening around the world. But also, you know, we want to make progress on sustainable uh, finance when it comes to investing in the energy transformation. We want to make sure that the Pacific is front and centre in the world's considerations about climate change and about other issues. Uh, we want to make progress on multinational tax reform. All of these issues are really important and they'll be part of the discussions over the next couple of days in India. How worried are you about some of the weaker data coming out of China at the moment? It's, it's critical for the Australian economy. Oh, it has been a focus, David. I'm not going to pretend uh, otherwise. There have been 
uh, some developments out of China that we are monitoring incredibly closely. Yeah, the global economy is a uh, pretty precarious place right now. Uh, the Americans are proving to be resilient. The Chinese economy has shown uh, some worrying signs. Uh, Europe's in recession and others as well. And so, as always, we're trying to take into consideration uh, this really quite substantial global economic uncertainty. It is having implications here and combined with what we're seeing from the impact of these rate rises, uh, it's one of the reasons why we do expect the Australian economy to slow considerably. All right, Treasurer, good luck with the trip. Thanks for joining us this morning. Appreciate it, David. Thanks very much. All right, coming up, we are going to dive into those Fadden by-election results. Let's continue this look at what's just happened or will be happening with the Reserve Bank with the change at the uh, top and bring in our panel. We're joined this week by Samantha Maiden, Shane Wright and Katina Curtis. Welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us. Let's just uh, kick off with the Reserve Bank. Um, we heard the Treasurer's explanation there as to why Philip Lowe's term wasn't extended, why Michelle Bullock is a better um, uh, leader for, for what's ahead for the Reserve Bank. Um, Shane Wright... Why was Philip Lowe replaced at the end of the day? Um, he's been in trouble since about 2018. And I, a lot of the political commentary that we've seen in the last two or three weeks is it's all about what he said in 2021. That is not true. It's clear, and this is one of the reasons why Jim Chalmers went very early. He said this in 20, early 2021, the RBA needs a review. And that's because if you look at, and this is what the review did, it looked at where the the bank in three key areas, pre-COVID, what it did during COVID and in the current period. Pre-COVID, the bank clearly had inflation too high. Uh, sorry, not inflation, but it had interest, interest rates, rates too high. And it had kept forecasting in, in late 2020, uh, 2018. Phil Lowe is saying, oh, we think the next move in interest rates will be up because wages will be rising, inflation will be up. He was wrong and he had to cut rates, started cutting rates and announced it three days after the 2019 election. Big problem in that point. And it, if, to put it in perspective, the Reserve Bank Review actually says there's research showing about two, a quarter of a million people were out of work because the RBA got that wrong. Now, that's really important at mm. the end of the day. You get into COVID, yep, they did a huge amount of work to protect the economy. They created about $400 billion dollars one of those, which was to give banks cheap money, $180 billion. It was supposed to help small businesses. It didn't. It probably ended up in the housing sector, which we now see some of the problems of that. And mm -hmm. then you get to this point now. Well, the point the coming out of COVID with the, uh, you know, we're going to keep rates or rates yeah. are likely to stay yeah. at these record lows. And, they, and, and, they didn't. and Phil Lowe wasn't uh, Robinson Crusoe. Every, just about every central bank got this wrong. But the review actually says the bank's problem has been an overemphasis on wages as a driver of inflation. Now, if you look at Phil Lowe's commentary over the last three, four, five months, it has been, oh, we're worried about wages growth. The review says, hold on, you guys are too focused on wages as a driver of inflation. So you can see all these things, as well as the internal problems that the bank has had. This is a bank that hasn't had a real shake-up in decades. You get to this point where Phil Lowe's probably not the person see, all to go that, yeah, forward. It's a, it's a fascinating list and timeline, and it all goes to the performance of the RBA. But, Sam, the government, in explaining this decision, is not talking about, publicly at least... Uh, the performance of, of Philip Lowe and the bank. It's all about, as we heard, the, the future. And Michelle Bullock will be better at implementing these reforms. No, it's all been done very deftly. It's been a silent murder. Light. <laughs> it's been a silent murder. And so what they have done is, you know, they clearly green-lighted backbenchers to have a, a pretty serious crack at him. And there were two occasions in recent days that I think made it really clear, or recent weeks, where the government was going if it wasn't obvious already, which is um, that, you know, Jim Chalmers made the, the criticism of that interest rate decision and also Anthony Albanese said that he'd made mistakes. Mm. So there's the writing on the wall right there. Mm. Um, the interesting question, though, I think, is how Michelle Bullock leads the RBA. She's highly respected. Um, you know, she's highly intelligent. Um, she's got a, you know, like all, most of these people, an interesting story. She started out in regional Australia and she's found her way at the top as Australia's first female central banker. But she is a lifer, right? I mean, she's worked there since 1985. She's obviously said all the right things in the 
um, you know, the inquiry process, the review process where she said, you know, things need to change. Well, Because the review, she, the review said things need to change internally. Sure, there is a problem with this she's part of that. And, and, and look, I mean, this is kind of obviously the least of the RBA's problems, but you sense it in dealing with them. They're very... I mean, Shane won't be allowed to say anything about this because he... But they're very pompous, right? They're very pompous and they're pompous with journalists and, you know, it's like some sort of... What do we say? Druids. It's, it's like some sort of cult, right? Gosh. And And they're going... <laughs> I'm sure if I go that fast. Well, but <laughs> they're going to have to get better at selling their message to the public. And, and well, you know, this is an incredible opportunity because it's like that kind of Hawke Keating period, an opportunity to explain economic concepts yeah. to Druids, punters. Druids and to do not. that, they're going to have to talk to the dirty, grubby journalists <laughs> <laughs> well, that they're very pompous to. The review is uh, requiring that after each decision or each meeting, they'll have to hold a press conference. So we will see uh, Michelle Bullock as the new governor having to do that. Um, but it, I guess, Katina, it's a, it's a balance, right? You need someone who knows what to do, has experience. She's nearly 40 years at the Reserve Bank. You, know, you balance that against what the review highlighted, the problem with these careerists at the Reserve Bank. Um, what do you think? Is, is it clear that she is going to be better placed than Philip Lowe in driving the reforms that uh, have been put forward? I think it's clear that the government thinks so. Yeah. Um, you know, they mentioned her leadership qualities so many times now. Those are sort of intangible things it's not not necessarily something that you can spell out on your cv you know xyz this qualification that yeah. but great great leader um she does it does sound like she is well regarded within the bank um kind of known for being someone who perhaps listens more takes on board different perspectives um that sort of thing and i think um the I think perhaps this idea with the press conference, as you say, it will be interesting to see. I mean, people are so switched on to what's going on economically at the moment. Will the RBA press conferences become the new COVID press conferences? <laughs> <laughs> like, Maybe. As if, you know, just everyday people are going to start watching them. Um, yeah. And then is that a problem? You know, something, the the... Um, comments that Michelle Bullock made regarding the unemployment level that you highlighted yeah. earlier. I mean, something that makes economic sense to, to an economist doesn't sound at all good to someone. That's a very someone. good point. And, yeah. and I also think even though the RBA is independent, having appointed her, they own her now. They own those decisions. And that the, the Peter Dutton will be able to say, fairly or unfairly, well, if interest rates go up again, this is... This is your pick. To a degree. I yeah, mean, there's yeah. still an independent... Um, of course, bank, yeah. ...independent board. And, look, what I just want to get your thoughts on before we move on uh, is, yes, all the internal reforms, more press conferences, fewer meetings. They'll go over two days, their, yep. their meetings. They're going to take their pyjamas. Take their pyjamas <laughs> along for a two-day meeting. Um, but what's it going to mean for interest rates? What's it going to... Is anything, Shane, going to change when it comes to the approach on um, tackling inflation under the yeah. new governor? I, I'm going to push back and say, remember that the RBA is responsible for the entire payment system of I this know. country. I know. There's a lot they do. And if you don't get the payment system wrong, uh, right, well, we can turn the lights off now and just go home because we'll be back in our caves with some canned goods. That's how important But I guarantee you, you most <laughs> homeowners are more worried about what they do on interest rates than, they, than the They system. are, and I think... And this, you get this through the review and the fact that so many of these changes are coming through... Like, Sam is right, oh, like, talking about this is uh, Phil Lowe, uh, Michelle Bullock is the governor, it's the, this yeah. government's choice, but you're getting into the fact that there's a board responsible. And this has been one of the issues, and all of the, all the changes and problems of the board, of the bank, over the last 10 years have been the Scott Morrison, the Joe Hockey, the Josh Frydenberg mm -hmm. board appointees. But is this governor... That's really important. I, I think is this governor going to be more hawkish, dovish, or the same as, as Philip Lowe? If you put six, pe six economists into a room, they'll have eight different opinions Amazing. on what that... On, of that very much question, right. that question, because she is really focused and will be focused on the data. I guess we will see. I guess we will see. Look, one of the more uh, extraordinary moments of the week, it must be said, was um, uh, the intervention from Peter Dutton the day before the announcement, where uh, he basically said this Reserve Bank job should not go to either the Treasury Secretary or the head of the Finance Department. We can't have a situation where the government is appointing somebody who is familiar to the government in the sense that they've worked 
very closely with ministers or with the treasurer or with the finance minister. Uh, we can't have somebody who has been appointed by uh, the Labor Party or indeed by uh, the coalition to a, a senior position within government. Well, indeed, uh, Stephen Kennedy was appointed by the coalition to the head of the Treasury Department. Jenny Wilkinson was appointed deputy head of Treasury by the coalition and then head of finance by, by Labor. They're both very highly regarded and professional public servants. What was... What did we learn, uh, Katina, from that um, intervention from it, Peter Dutton? It, it definitely was a very strange thing to say. And the other thing that I thought was that it was actually almost a safe criticism for him to make. Um, Jim Chalmers did consult with the Shadow Treasurer, Angus Taylor, on the appointment earlier in the week. Now, so you he think he knew they he, weren't going to get the job? I think he would have known the direction of the government's thinking, even if he didn't know exactly. I mean, Chalmers has said that he formed a view some time ago that Michelle Bullock should should have the job. So you'd have to think that he should have he would have at least known the direction or of their the thinking. Leaves. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, it, but it, it definitely was a very strange thing to say, and I think perhaps it it, it showed the ongoing um, the disdain or a level of disdain that the coalition has for the public service, which we've just been very well, deftly highlighted in the robo debt. Just coming out of that royal commission in yeah. robo debt and about how we need a robust public service, Sam did it. I mean, Peter Dutton's own word was they're, they're tainted. What does that tell us about how he views the public service? Well, it was a dumb thing to say. Um, that's what it tells us. It tells us that sometimes Peter Dutton says dumb things. <laughs> and, uh, you know, th there, there has been speculation that he was trying to be too smart by half and that maybe Angus Taylor knew. But, I mean, he, Angus Taylor has told people that Jim Chalmers did not tell him the name. You might be right, though, about him Reading doing the directions. Yeah. But all of the Liberal people that I was ringing on the front bench right up until the end were saying that they didn't really know who it was, although I note that Laura Tingle uh, belled the cat on the... She did the night before. The night yeah, before, saying yeah. it was Michelle Bullock. Um, but, yeah, so I think that... The thing I think is strange about it is if he did know he was trying to look like he had some sort of influence on the result, and then Anthony Albanese shot that down mm. and said that it had zero impact. But regardless, I think that if they want to start functioning as an opposition, they don't have to, like, suck up to the public service, but at some point they're going to want these people to leak to them, right? If you're constantly sort of, like, pouring... Well, or just work with them. ..the ver verbial yeah, yeah, over yeah. their heads, like... And then, just on the, on the principle itself, you. Shane, I mean, I, I, uh, these, like Jenny Wilkinson spent 10 years at the RBA. These people do go back and forth sometimes between Treasury and yeah. Reserve Bank. Yeah, but you're right. You shouldn't call them tainted. That, that's but really is that tainted, yeah. Or does that yeah. make them actually well, you, pretty well placed? It's, like, it's the short-term memory loss, like Martin Parkinson and the brouhaha that caused when Tony Abbott wanted to get rid of him. Mm. And it caused problems. And the fact mm. that you can't remember Bernie Fraser brought in from Treasury to head the Reserve Bank. But some and people criticise that. But I mean, At yeah. the time, but remember what happened. Paul Keating, to this day, is still angry with Bernie Fraser for lifting interest rates in the run-up to the 96 election. That's they the don't, independence. They don't always turn out to be as captured no, as people think. But, right. but that, that is the argument that Angus Taylor was running, was the Keating one, and basically yeah. saying that this is a problem, you don't want a situation where they're, they're captured. But, like, who is to say that... Jenny Wilkinson or Stephen Kennedy would be captured or yeah. like by the Labor government. And it, it causes a problem for the future if you're saying right, we, we're wiping out the senior public servants who might know what they're doing from a real, the most critical economic role in the country, which is the RBA governor. Like that is, you are you've had a whole review saying sometimes it, the bank's got too insular, it needs outside advice. And you're saying, well, well, we'll just ignore that. But sometimes I think there's a bit of cultural cringe as well because there's, there's a lot of people who will say, oh, they just should have gotten someone from overseas. Well, who's to say that oh, there's someone from overseas? Well, they did consider would, somebody from overseas. Yeah, yeah, would be better necessarily than Michelle Bullock, who yeah. has lived and breathed the organisation since the 1980s. Yes, there are criticisms on the other side of the ledger that she's too much of an insider, but I think that this idea that if you magically pluck someone yeah, would have been London, big, I reckon there would have been big political risk bringing someone in from overseas to yeah. start jacking up interest rates here yeah. as well. Yeah, so look, totally. <laughs> uh, let's turn to the fad and buy election. Um, looking at the results, yeah, it'll bounce around still a bit in the days to come, no doubt. But if the swing to the LNP's around 2.5%, as mm. roughly is at the moment, Katina, what does that tell us? Well, 
it is interesting because, you know, everyone's sort of saying kind of status quo or on the plus side for um, Peter Dutton. Um, it actually, the swing, if it does stay around 2.5%, that's still a point below what the swing that Labor got to them in the last election. So they haven't clawed everything back. In that seat. Yeah. In that seat. Um, I think that particularly if you listen to what Peter Dutton was saying uh, during the campaign, definitely cost of living was the thing um, that everyone was talking about. People were telling me that it was it is hurting people more um, that or people are paying more attention than they were during the Aston by-election. He was also, though, running a quite strong law and order campaign, which is to do with state government issues around the levels of policing. And, and, and the state leaders stood up last night at the yep. victory event to, yeah, to really drive home that him. point. That's right, right. yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's, so, you know, really almost conflating the two issues. Um, and I, I think it's probably was as much about the state Labor Party as much as the, the federal Labor. Yeah, and that may be true. The state election next year in Queensland, so they're, they're taking that opportunity. Um, Sam, Queensland, at least, you know, they haven't gone backwards. A little swing to them. This is their strong state, Peter Dutton's backyard. What do, what do you make of the result? Pirate time. Um, I'm looking forward to Cameron coming to Canberra. I think it's exciting. Uh, he's obviously got an interesting backstory. And the other thing we learned, of course, is Gold Coast voters don't just like pirates, they also like marijuana. Um, because the marijuana... Did the marijuana... People are going to be Googling your references out. here to yeah. Cameron Cobalt. But sure. But no, no, no. Decent. Nothing to do with him. No, no. They make no. marijuana just, to understand where you're just, going here, Sam. Come on. Well, he, he... You know, he just had a little hiccup ten years ago when he was pre-selected somewhere else where he went to a pirate party and... It was all a bit controversial. But yeah. anyway, that's anyway. been dealt with now. Yes. We're, the, yes. we're over Voters the, have overcome the that, pirate situation. <laughs> but I think that it's... Look, it's a, it's a perfectly good result for Peter Dutton. There's a little ray of sunshine there for him. Um, and, you know, that, that will be a little bit of wind in their sails. You know, like, I, I don't see how you could really... I mean, I take your point about they haven't clawed everything back, but I don't think you could really look at the result in Fadden and think that that's a problem mm. for Peter Dutton. The Labor's line, of course, they spent... The bare minimum, 50 grand, they reckon, compared to 10 times that for uh, for the LNP. It was basically a run to get the show ready for the state election next year. It, it, do, do you buy that, Shane, that they're, they're not really phased at all by this result? I, I don't see them troubled, um, given how much the LNP threw at that seat. And, look, from Peter Dutton's point of view, this is a, this is a, a win is a win. You yeah. take it and you move on. And that, they needed a confidence boost. Mm. Aston was such a... A, a traumatic there was result. far more at stake yeah. for Peter Dutton last yeah. night than That's Anthony right. Albanese. But let's, you can't get overconfident. Longman and Braddon by elections. Bill Shorten thought, yep, we go, we go, mm. we're on our way. And yeah, didn't transfer. Does this, does this at the very least um, lock in Peter Dutton's leadership and his strategy in, in terms of the way he's just belting the government on everything? I think the interesting thing, and he, he touched on that in the speech last night, is he talked about how important it was for him to keep the show together. Yeah. And that is obviously his driving force. And because what I find surprising a lot of the time is some of the people that are in a bit of strife at the moment, whether it's Scott Morrison or Stuart Robert, um, these are people that Peter Dutton had a professional, respectful relationship with, but he didn't like them, right? I mean, he, he's not a fan of, you know, like... I mean, he's, he's got his views on Scott Morrison and Stuart Robert, right? Like, they might not share them publicly, but, like, everyone in the party knows where he sits on that stuff. And I just find it surprising... Particularly, I think it's a mistake with robo-debt that he hasn't been making a clearer bit more line in the sand. Yeah. And that this is, it's to do with his loyalty and it's also to do with the fact that he hates the media. So if anyone in the media is having a go at someone, even if he thinks that they're a bit of a dumbo, they'll, he'll back them in. But I think it's, it's a mistake because, personally, I think that robo-debt is a, a, not only a violation of, you know, it's a public policy vandalism, but it's an assault on the values of the Liberal Party, which are meant to be about small government and looking after people and not having this sort of big yeah. government people and, and the unfairness of it. There's a really strong argument that Scott Morrison, who I don't think really understands Liberal Party values, I'm not sure what he really believes in, um, he abandoned... The, 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 the values of Menzies and the values of Liberal Party with this just, program. And just on robot I mean, in the context of this by-election, Labor really used this as, as a... Mm. Um, you know, they, they ran pretty hard on robo-debt and reminding people, Stuart Robert, the former member... And, what and it didn't make much of a dent. No. Well, yeah. I was going to say, it's, it's also a way for Labor to keep reminding people about the Morrison government and tie Peter Dutton to that 
year and all the, the you know, bad things, including robo debt. But is there a sense, do you think, after this result, that that gets harder for, for Labor, or will they continue on this I mission? Think that, I don't think they'll continue because Fadden is not the seat that you would be running that sort of campaign. You are looking more perhaps in the outer suburbs or those inner suburbs which like or the independent held seats, which the Liberal Party at the end of the day, they have to find a way to win back Kuyong or win back Wentworth yep. or the entire North Shore of Sydney at this moment. And, and this result the doesn't really tell has us what's this gonna happen. Incredible there. gift right now, which is that Scott Morrison's still in Parliament. Yep. He's still there. Sitting there. Well, just on that, any no, speeches. just on that, there's plenty of debate about that this week, right after that Royal Commission report, uh, amongst his um, colleagues, whether he should stay or go and when and if uh, he will uh, leave Parliament. I, uh, I want to show you this from the Nationals leader, David Littleproud, who is well, fairly blunt. If his heart's not in it, he should leave. Uh, it's up to Scott Morrison to have that conversation with the people of Cook uh, and to adequately make a determination that if there's someone better that's more uh, energised to continue on to represent the people of Cook, then he should step aside. Yeah. Tell us what you're wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, my understanding is that Morrison doesn't want to feel like he's being pushed out. He wants to be able to stand on the booths with the next candidate for Cook and, you know, have people come and say, you know, thanks for everything that you've done. Oh, Whereas gee, if he's sort of pushed out... I know, but if, if he's sort of pushed out, then... Yeah, it's not you a know, he, he, he doesn't do want to look like he's forced but out. If, yeah, he, if, so. he, if he had a job, he'd leave. He's not leaving because he doesn't have a job. None of this is mm. going to help his job prospects either, you wouldn't, sure. you wouldn't think. But, like, that's what's going on. And, and obviously, you know, there is this thing that people have raised, which is, you know, he doesn't have that personal wealth of Malcolm Turnbull and, you know, he's got a family to support. Like no one it, has yeah. the personal wealth of Malcolm Turnbull. No, <laughs> <Come good point. laughs> <laughs> they, they do things differently in Point Piper. Um, but, yeah, like, I mean, so he, if, he, the... if, he could, if he could nick off, he'd nick off. What's he... the mood? I mean, we heard David Little proud there. I've got to say, listening to other Liberals uh, during the week, didn't really hear anyone saying, we need him to stay. Yes. What's the, what's the sentiment um, in, in the ranks at the moment about what he should do. Not that anyone's going to say, go his, now. His best years are not ahead of him at this point. And, that, and it is that constant reminder that's mm. sitting there like the black cloud in the, at the back bench, which... It, but he's for, not for like the... a black cloud. To be fair, he's just a big nothing. He doesn't say anything about much at all, right? I mean, he occasionally pops overseas where he gets sometimes paid to give a speech, right? But, I mean, his contribution in Parliament is very limited. Now, it's not a malevolent contribution. He doesn't go right. around picking fights or he stays out of... He keeps his kind of hands clean. He's not on but, any committees. But, but, you know, I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, work for the dole, I mean, when is this guy going to give some speeches, right? No, seriously, <laughs> this is outrageous. He's being paid $200,000 a year plus more to sit there like he's on some sort of gardening leave. Why should taxpayers pay for that? Like, if he should... He should get in there. Look, I'm sure he does the old, you know, scissor river cutting in his electorate or something. But he's not making a substantial contribution to Parliament. He's okay, not. Yeah. Like, I mean, and so why is he there? Why are we paying for this, right? Why does he... He may, Look, he may be... Why is he entitled to that much? Mentoring money? behind the scenes. But I think the tally of how many contributions he's made on the floor are about three... Uh, since well, I think it might be four, four. now. Okay. But yes. Sure, but they're all, like we've discussed this before, but mm. the majority of them are legacy items where he's defending, defending his himself. activities. Yeah, yeah. Or, and you know, I don't begrudge him this, or he's getting taxpayers to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars as his legal fees. I imagine that takes up some time as well, conferring with the, legal, the lawyers. I mean, is that really what we're paying for? So we're going to pay him $200,000 a year plus for three or four years for him to sort of confer with and this, lawyers? And, and this is where some members of the Liberal Party are, exactly where Sam is talking about, is, right, this Cook is a safe seat. It's an important seat. Get someone in there who's going to That's make right. a contribution. And get them in... Because th this party, the Liberal Party, needs to revitalise. It needs change. Not a seat need, warmer. Not a seat, but it and it also needs policy development. You need someone to sort of liven things up a little bit th because the party has been in trouble since, yeah, since the election. Yeah, and it's interesting, right? Linda Silmalis had a really interesting story a couple of weeks ago in the Sunday Telegraph that um, Peter Dutton and, and Hurst, Andrew Hurst had written to the New South Wales Liberals saying they want to reopen, uh, well, they want to open pre-selections 
as soon mm. as possible before the end of the year. It'll be really interesting to see what happens in it that space. Will. Let's turn to the current uh, Prime Minister. Um, Anthony Albanese made a trip to Berlin and then the NATO summit in Lithuania earlier in the week. Um, there were some deals done in Germany um, on the defence front, a climate uh, agreement as well, Australia signing up to the Climate Club. When it comes to NATO, though, did, 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 is it clear coming out of this what NATO wants in terms of its, its connection and uh, with this region, with the Indo-Pacific? It, it just seemed a little confused on the NATO side. I think you probably had um, the, like the sort of the NATO secretariat kind of saying one thing and then you had others like Emmanuel Macron coming out and, you know, saying, oh, we don't, why are we opening an office in Japan? What are we, what are we pushing into there? But they keep inviting us and a few others from here to go to their meetings every year. Yeah, and, and they've started to be a bit more outspoken on China and the, you know, the threats or perceived threats there as well. So I, I think that, you know, there maybe is a role to play um, for NATO. Someone put to me that there's no... So you have the OECD for this particular sort of group of developed countries um, talking about economic things and working through issues together. There's no equivalent sort of security forum. Mm. Um, and so perhaps NATO is trying to position Evolve itself that. as that. One of the things uh, the Prime Minister did do was meet with the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and committed a further 30 Bushmaster vehicles, which was certainly welcomed. The package of military support, which is crucial and very important on the battlefield so we are very thankful for all of this but there are some details after out of the camp that we'll discuss with you we, 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 <laughs> we still need your support so shane thanks very much what else have you got yeah. <laughs> that's right and but you can see this is developing around the world about like the the pushback about ukraine mm. becoming an immediate member of nato what would that mean like we, we know what the policy of NATO is. If a member's attacked, right, we're all in. Do you really want to start off a hot war against Russia? Um, you can see it in the US Republicans, the issues, the growing disquiet about putting more resources and more troops into Ukraine. They're saying, right, like the, the US Republicans are a bit wild at the best of times uh, under Trump, but now there's this, there's this questioning of it, especially as the war continues. The comment by who was it? Out the Ben British, Wallace. Ben the UK Wallace. Defense. Yeah, we're not yeah, out. What, what did he say? He went to. Uh, well, he's um, yeah responded to Ukraine's constant requests mm. for help and said. He what said is we're it? not Amazon, and he said show a bit of gratitude. Yeah. Like, but you can understand where yeah. Ukraine's coming from. They're getting pounded. Um, people are dying. This this mm -hmm. war's dragging on. Um, they they need help. Uh, but it's this interesting friction point, isn't it, in terms of how the um, donor countries are, are now feeling? Blood and treasure, or, which always is at the heart of a, a war that continues on. And you can see those who are supplying the treasure are starting to think, oh, hold on, mm. how much longer will this mm. continue? While he was over there, the Prime Minister did meet a whole bunch of European leaders, including Emmanuel Macron, talked about the, the free trade agreement with the EU. Uh, Don Farrell, the Trade Minister, also made a dash to Brussels, hoping to finalise the deal uh, over a couple of days. Wasn't to be, turned out, no deal yet. We've made it very clear right from the start that uh, we won't simply accept any agreement. Um, the agreement from the Australian point of view uh, has to achieve meaningful agricultural access to European markets uh, and that's what we are continuing to pursue uh, in these negotiations. So as I understand it, the, uh, the countries that are the problem ones still for this deal to happen are France and Ireland and it's the beef and uh, lamb products, the access for our Aussie beef and lamb that's the issue. Dairy and sugar apparently looking, looking a bit better now. But look, you know, Katina, what do you think? They're, if the deal's not good enough, we're not signing up, seems to be the message. Yeah, I think so. And I think there was a, a level of surprise from the European side that um, they thought that we were just bluffing and wouldn't actually walk away. Um, so I think that they were quite surprised that um, that happened. My understanding is there was some briefing out of the European side that Don Farrell had stormed out and um, the, oh, certainly the goodness. Australians say a different story. Um, they say it was just... Don Farrell being Don Farrell. Um, 
<laughs> so, he's lovely. He's very mild mannered. I can't imagine storming out. <laughs> storming out of anywhere. But but yeah, I mean, it's certainly. I think he's really shown them that Australia won't just sign up to anything. That's been the public rhetoric from the Prime Minister as well. Um, and there is some suggestion from people close to the negotiations that um, the Europeans maybe have a bit more at stake because they really want to land this deal before um, the European elections, yeah. parliamentary elections next year. Uh, the deal with Australia is the only one in the pipeline. They don't have anything else that they could land in time. It's just like the good old days when he was doing the Shoppies Retail Award in Adelaide. It's just a bigger canvas, you know, an EU trade job. But we've probably been spoilt by a Boris Johnson, right? Remember when Boris yeah. Johnson just accidentally gave us everything and now we probably think that's how it works. Well, the PM did meet with uh, the, the current British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, while he was there and there was a bit of, um, bit of sledging between the two. A bit more light-hearted, <laughs> though, than what we saw on the cricket pitch. I'd like to something less sophisticated. Just, Ooh, just to sort oh. of... Uh, okay. Okay. Right, 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 right. 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 Oh, I'll run my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be really provocative. <laughs> <here, but laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry I didn't bring my sandpaper with me. Sure. Right. <laughs> okay. there's, a, there's a crease. They like to ham it up. Uh, <laughs> they do. <laughs> Shame. But uh, Rishi Sunak, well, he's, it's 15 to 18 points behind on the primary vote in uh, Britain at the right? moment. Yeah, it's Keir Starmer is yeah a long way ahead. Long way ahead. Yeah. Uh, look, yeah, that's interesting. But just just on that um, EU uh, free trade, part of the part of the reason that we're in these talks is after Brexit. You know, this is an opportunity for Australia. Um, it's our critical minerals that's the kind of carrot here, right? That Europe wants. Yes, it's a great big market for us to get a hold of, but that's kind of the leverage, isn't it, Shane? That it is a huge piece of leverage, given the importance, particularly out of as, as the EU economy is transitioning away from coal and the huge in, in electrification of the economy that they need. They need those rare metals. All right, our panel, Katina Curtis, Shane Wright and Samantha Maiden, will be back shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with journalist, columnist and author Antoinette Latouf and a very warm welcome back. Top of the morning to you. Antoinette, we may not be part of NATO but we're more part of MATO. You know what, I just love how Albanese here has had to tell everybody that he's a significant player and it kind of reminds me of Ron Burgundy in Anchorman where if you have to tell people you're a big deal, big, maybe you're not because here uh, the Ukrainian PM is looking at him going, like, bro, who told you you were a significant player? Just give me 30 more bush bastards. Exactly. He loves strutting that stage, does our Prime Minister. And French PM Macron looks chuffed. It doesn't have to do with Scott Morrison yeah. anymore. That's what this photo says to me. I did love this David Rowe cartoon, the Xenia PJK 2023. So, so there's the German Chancellor Olaf. Yeah. Um, and the boxer is good, uh, Anthony. But tell me more about this PJK drone. You do not want to get in his crosshairs. I did love this Kathy Wilcox, oh, it, it really is an emotional cartoon, cluster bombs and dandelions. The dandelion plant produces seed, seed heads. heads. Yeah, wind disperses the dandelion seeds, the seeds land and when conditions are suitable, germinate. Not all germinate immediately, some lie awaiting the intervention perhaps of a curious child. Like this would be a really cute cartoon if it wasn't so callous and yeah. of course it's referring to the cluster bombs that uh, President Joe Biden is selling to the Ukraine um, despite many countries including Australia thinking that it's unsafe because they, they detonate and yep. they... Well, there's only a few countries that actually still allow them. And yeah. The USA is one of them. Fiona Kataskis has a message for us. We'll talk the talk, but realistically won't be fully committed to saving the climate club. Yeah, like this climate club is almost like a BFF charm. You know, yeah. they've they've agreed to, to, to be besties and do something great, but there are actually no pledges, there's yep. no plan. Yeah, lovely Alan Moyer cartoon. It, it sort of sums it up, Antoinette. Mm. Um, hottest day ever recorded, uncharted territory, according to the UN, with uh, the Prime Minister saying we're doing our bit. Um, Bit yeah. of water on the sun. The only thing it looks like Albanese is extinguishing here is people's hopes yeah. that he's actually serious about yeah, yeah. mitigating climate change. Yeah. And to an end, it's not just the algorithm and blues, it's what the robo debt inquiry has revealed mm. about what goes on inside the government that I find truly disturbing. That that it can go so far when 
public servants know what the end objective is. They're willing to not just bend the rules, but break them. And also be on pretty profitable pay packets. Mark Knight is channeling the Robocop here. He's a long way from Detroit. Now it's after its creators, as the, uh, the Robodebt um, robots coming from public servants and the former coalition government. Seems Philip Lowe has got to go. Michelle Bullock will be the next um, RBA governor. Mark Knight had a suggestion that perhaps the pub test could be a real thing. I think this is really clever. And to be fair, I have never known a time where so many regular people know the name of the RBA governor. I know, right? Yeah. Under new changes, the Reserve Bank will hold its meetings on interest rate settings in hotels around the country so the decision can undergo the pub test. Mark Knight does a, uh, a rowdy pub crowd better than anyone. Finally, a very sad note to end on. The former member for Herbert, um, Ewan Jones, passed away this week. And um, he was a bit of a rarity in Canberra in that he was a uh, person first and a politician second. So our condolences to his family. He'll, he'll be missed greatly. And uh, on that sad note, I'll let you do the honours. That is back to you, Spearsy. Thank you very much. And yes, our thoughts uh, with the family and, and friends, loved ones of Ewan Jones. He was an absolute classic, uh, no doubt about that, uh, in his time in Parliament. Let's get some final observations. Katina, to you first. Uh, we saw the childcare subsidy increase this past week. Um, MPs, uh, including the, the minister and the shadow minister, I'm hearing are uh, getting lots of calls from parents about their fees going up. Um, I think that something that's been missed or forgotten in the way that this has been explained is that even though the government's putting billions of dollars in, the childcare centres aren't getting any more money overall. So when there's calls to pay educators more, the money's got to come from somewhere. All right, Shane. Um, apart from appointing Michelle Bullock as governor of the RBA, uh, Jim Chalmers now has to appoint a new deputy governor. He has an assistant governor for the economy, which is really the chief economist role of the Reserve Bank, and a chief operating officer. So there's huge more, there's a lot more change to come inside the Reserve Bank. He's also reviewing and refreshing the Productivity Commission. He's going to have to appoint a new chair later in the year. Chalmers is becoming the treasurer who's making huge changes to two really important economic institutions we haven't seen that sort of we haven't seen that change at the RBA before either so the reformist liberal uh, labor uh, tradition particularly in the economy is really coming through with Chalmers mm, good point Sam uh, well I would also like to say farewell to Ewan Jones who was a wonderful character and someone who always made you feel happier and more cheerful after leaving his company than before because he was an absolute delight. Um, and just returning to the New South Wales pre-selection issue, it'd be interesting to see if they do put the pressure on them to pre-select candidates and get them in the field before The Voice. Um, not necessarily a bad thing, but that, that can put some of the candidates under the punt about what their view on The Voice is. Just on that too, Wonder Watch, this week we we're due to get the wording of the yes and no uh, campaign pamphlets, the official wording that goes out. We should see that at some point uh, during On this Tuesday. week. Tuesday. Tuesday, is it? Yep. There you go. All right, thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Finally, we mentioned the Prime Minister's visit to Berlin earlier in the week. The Germans are, of course, famous for their precision. The member for Marrickville, perhaps not so much. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. And I all feel very excited about being here.